Welcome everybody. Good evening in Europe. Uh, late good morning to everybody joining us in the US and beyond. Thank you for participating in our discussion series notes, art and tech encounters. We are very excited to continue the discussion series with today's edition about AI and creativity. I'm Bettina Wodjanka, cultural program curator at the Goethe Institute San Francisco, and we are hosting this event as a member of the Unique Cluster Silicon Valley. The Unique Cluster Silicon Valley is a network of European diplomatic and cultural institutions working with local partners in the Bay Area and beyond. Notes is a series of talks that bring together artists, technologists, and researchers from the US and Europe to engage in a dialogues about the potential and necessity of interdisciplinary collaborations um, between arts and technology. It was established within the Unique Cluster Silicon Valley as part of the GRIT. Today's event is organized by the Goethe Institute San Francisco in collaboration with our colleagues from the delegation of Flanders to the USA. I want to especially thank our colleague Nicolas Pouli, Director of Public and Academic Affairs of the Delegation of Flanders to the United States. Dear everybody tuning in, please submit your questions at any point during the conversation via the Q&A function. We are more than happy to include them in the conversation. We would love for you to be part of the talk and shape this conversation actively. I am very excited about our panelists for the, today's conversation. Before we go directly in Medias Ries, please let me introduce our moderator, Sha Wei Wang, who has also co-curated this edition. Sha Wei Wang is an artist, coder, and a writer. They are creative director at Logic Magazine, a magazine devoted to deepening the discourse around technology. Furthermore, they have published the work Blockchain Chicken Farm and other stories of tech in China's countryside, unraveling the ties between globalization, technology, agriculture, and commerce. Their work in general, in general encompasses community-based projects on technology, ecology, and education cultivating a nourishing community through stewarding spaces, public art, workshops, data visualization, and making collaborative tools. Their projects have been finalists for the Index Design Awards, featured on CNN and the BBC by the New York Times and more. Xave, it's a great honor having you here. And without further ado, I'm handing over to you. Thank you so much, Bettina, um, and for that very generous introduction. Hi, everyone. So thank you to the audience and especially our incredible panelists today um, for making time um, to have this conversation. Um, today, we'll be discussing AI and creativity and you know, touching upon topics like, what do we mean when we say the term artificial creativity? Um, personally, when I think of AI and creativity or AI and art, I actually go back to maybe the days of Michelangelo and the church, where the church was commissioning paintings to be done in these beautiful chapels. And maybe there's a parallel um, between, you know, when Google asks artists to use DeepMind or, you know, uh, Magenta to start and create AI artworks but maybe there's also not a parallel. So we'll explore things like that today. Um, and also the dimensions of who gets to be labeled creative or a creative genius um, versus um, people who don't and the politics and power behind that. So without further ado, we have four incredible panelists today. Um, they come from across art, AI ethics, computer science, and research. Um, in terms of format, each of them will give a five minute introduction about themselves and their work. And we'll move to a discussion as well as taking questions from the audience. Um, as Bettina mentioned, this conversation is being recorded. So I think it'll be a great resource um, in the future as well for people who are thinking through these critical topics. Um, so 
In this order, we first have researcher, artist, technologist, uh, Buse Chetin. Um, then we have artist, educator, researcher, uh, Sarah Siston. Um, after Sarah will be professor and research scientist, Luke Steele. And um, then we have artist, technologist, uh, Emily Martinez. So let's give a virtual round of applause. I'm gonna take the liberty of giving actual applause. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, Buse, you have the floor. Thank you. I was trying to find the Zoom applause. Um, thanks for um, inviting me here. I feel very privileged and honored to be with you. Um, I am, um, as, as I was introduced, I am an independent AI researcher, consultant and creative, and I care about um, how AI technologies are impacting us and especially uh, marginalized communities. Um, so today I'm going to talk about our joint project uh, with um, my friend, artist and designer friend Nushin Yazdani, climate justice activist Mira Ghani, Sara Diedro Jordao and uh, designer Iobisek. It is called Dreaming Beyond AI. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Um, so Dreaming Beyond AI um, is currently a project in building and it's going to be launched end of uh, November or December. It's a digital think and make tank on AI um, and society and is a space for visionary fiction and speculative arts, community organizing and resources for design side of things uh, because this is where I believed you could do the most impact. Um, so yeah, I started um, my work in AI from the policy angle of things. Uh, I was working at a think tank because where I this this was uh, where I believed we could do the most impact. It was through regulations and rules, but I changed my mind uh, quite quickly. Uh, but before I go to, or maybe we will touch upon that uh, through the questions, before I go to there, I want to ask you, what are the images, what are the ideas, what are the things that you see when I say AI? And this was a common concern uh, for uh, Nushin and me, because when we said AI or when we're talking to other people who don't work on this professionally about AI, um, we were thinking they were thinking about humanoid robots and uh, dystopian films and science fiction, Hollywood science fiction films and, and so on. And I hope you will have the time to maybe talk about also the impact of these dep depictions and narratives uh, also as uh, pieces of art. Uh, but there is also this very important um, strong discourse about why AI is important and if you're not using AI that you're falling behind and it's a source of growth and productivity while we're facing a humanitarian planetary crisis. So um, we were quite intrigued and when you actually also dig a little bit deeper and maybe, uh, I don't know, um, the, the audience members of the audience are also familiar with these things um, you see that there are actually harms that are happening, that are impacting impacting the livelihoods, access to opportunities, resources of people. Um, because when you look at it, AI is a statistical tool of knowledge compression that uses data, which is um, a representation and a reduction of the past. Uh, so uh, the current power structures, categorizations through which uh, certain privileges um, and opportunities are distributed in the society are actually amplified by AI technologies. And unfortunately, the ones that are negatively impacted are uh, usually marginalized people. And they are the ones also doing the work of finding out what's wrong with these technologies. So when you also look at the other side of the coin, you see that an, a stark lack of um, diversity, or although I don't like this term, or a, a stark concentration of uh, power when it comes to AI in terms of the design, imagining, and also benefiting from the technology uh, to a certain demographics and a certain um, area of the world. Uh, so it's not 
you know, who is creating the visions and who is creating the technology, it matters because we think about things through metaphors, through words, through visions that we see about them. It also um, shapes the tra future trajectory of the technologies. Um, it also, I think, uh, influences the public trust and uh, our tolerance to what we expect and what we get out of a certain technology. So we were uh, both, me and Nushin, were very concerned with this and we were thinking about, you know, how we can make a change. And I think where we are trying to make something different uh, very humbly is, you know, bringing a research, art, advocacy and policymaking um, together. Um, this is just an example and I'm going to um, finish soon. Um, I don't know, maybe many of you know the MIT computer scientist researcher and the founder of Algorithms Justice League, Joy Bulanwini, who is a, a huge inf um, inspiration with her work. Uh, and when she was, uh, you know, um, showing and making the case for facial recognition technologies or gender, gender classifying systems that were uh, systematically failing um, at rec recognizing black women's uh, faces and genders as compared to white men. She first started with an academic paper uh, where she, where um, uh, Joy Bulanwini and her co-authors use an, an intersectional data set to prove their point. And then uh, she also started, uh, you know, appearing at policymaking spaces, making the case for it and also using art and, and poetry to uh, make these what's happening actually accessible and maybe also quote unquote interesting for people. So this was also a big um, inspiration for us. And we are currently inviting artists, researchers, policymakers, activists, organizers to understand and also um, question, redefine and, and bring about new visions about the technologies and particularly AI from a critical perspective. I can uh, say a lot more, but I think I don't have enough time. So I will maybe stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pusa. Um Up next, we have uh, Sarah Siston. Um, thank you so much to the Goethe Institute, and I'm really excited to join my fellow panelists um, in the conversation around this topic today. So I make weird things with text-driven machine learning to discover its limits and its possibilities. And I'm especially interested in how we can bring more ethical, equitable, and intersectional practices into our collaborations with these systems. Um, and I come to this research through an unconventional background in creative writing and design alongside self-taught coding, which helps me translate these concepts across different groups. And my main work at the moment is the Intersectional AI Toolkit, which is a collection of small magazines or zines, which are practical introductory field guides to key concepts, strategies, and resources on both AI and intersectionality. With issues like a two-sided glossary, AI, I, A, I, A, I, A to Z, strategy flashcards, tactics for intersectional AI, and a guide to concepts for skeptics called Help Me Understand Intersectionality. The zines serve as jumping off points to inspire readers' own further exploration and creation around AI bias, code, and the communities they affect, with the goal to re-envision ways of thinking about AI using intersectional methods. Um, connecting with the Berlin-based Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society during a fellowship there, I launched the project with the zine workshop and discussion panel joined by researchers, artists, coders, and designers. And together, we affirmed the need for tools like the Intersectional AI Toolkit and resources to support connecting those who are disproportionately harmed by AI systems with those who are creating them so that we can fundamentally rethink their design and implementation. I think this really connects with exactly what Buse was just talking about, which is fantastic. Um, and with this in mind, the IAI toolkit will have more zine workshops to come, be available to print out at home, and also be open source on GitHub and available for commenting, editing, forking, and thus open to conversation, update, and expansion. And I also want to quickly share two other projects that show a bit more of my work. 
using AI tools and tactical media intervention directly. This is Inner VoiceOver, which asks how we might rewrite the inner critic using natural language processing. It creates a self-compassion database using speech to text to speech built with Mozilla Deep Speech, GPT-3, and Descript voice synthesis and participant contributions. It considers how our deepest thoughts regarding ourselves are incredibly social. That is, they're informed by our experiences in community. And in that sense, they are trained, not unlike machine learning models are trained. And with both humans and machines, I'm especially interested in the opportunity for error, imperfection, and subjectivity. So a person will speak into one end, and this will get translated into a Siri, Alexa, style voice, but made in the style of my own voice. I'll play a sample for you here. You're good enough just as you are. Um, and my project Lady Mouth is a chatbot that tries to explain feminism to misogynists on Reddit. By standing in for folks like myself who might not wish to engage in online spaces uh, where they'd get harassed, Lady Mouth trolls the trolls, so to speak, with micro gestures of tactical media. In doing so, it also draws attention to the ways that digital language is just as embodied and embedded in the material spaces as language offline. So in both projects, I'm trying to emphasize that AI models are socially constructed, which means that we are responsible to each other for their formation. Thus, we have an opportunity to care for each other better by rewriting them together. And by using creative practice to attend to error and hyperbole, in these systems first, we can move away from trying to perfect bias and error out of them, which is an impossible task. And we can reclaim space for the other kinds of values that they hold, such as poetry, humor, and compassion. And just quickly to highlight two other organizations that I'm a part of and would be delighted to share more about with anyone. Um, in January, I helped launch the Anti-Racist Critical Code Studies Reading Group, which looks at how to take more active approaches to anti-discrimination through close readings of the, at the level of the line of code itself. And three years ago, I started a student group called Creative Code Collective, which takes scrappy artistic approaches to co-learning programming with the belief that anyone can contribute to the future of digital systems, and we all have skills to teach each other. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. Um, and next we have Professor Luke Steeles. Um, yeah, so um, I will introduce a bit where I'm, I'm coming from. I actually uh, am already working in AI for a long time. I started in uh, languages, philosophy, literature, but then moved to computational linguistics quite early. And uh, I studied at MIT in the artificial intelligence lab in the mid, late six, uh, 70s, sorry, uh, with uh, Marvin Minsky was my uh, advisor. <clears throat> and, um, and then I worked in uh, industrial expert systems. Actually, my my first paper in, in AI was at the uh, AI conference in Edinburgh, one of the first European AI conferences in 1974. So this is, I'm almost celebrating 50 years <laughs> in AI. Uh, but so uh, let me share also a bit my, uh, my screen. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, I, I worked a lot in very technical side of AI, building knowledge representation systems, reasoning systems at MIT, and uh, also working on the first industrial applications of AI. For example, I was working for a while at uh, Schlumberger Doll Research Labs, who were building um, what was called a dip meter advisor, which is, you know, they, exp they do um, exploration. And they have these, these tools that they lower in boreholes to, to get an idea of the geological structures. And so I was involved in, in uh, projects to, you know, to, to interpret these, uh, these data. Uh, this was in the early 80s when there was actually a kind of similar wave of uh, enthusiasm, if not to say hype, about AI. And... Um, 
I don't think what we did at that time uh, was a failure, but it was just absorbed by normal uh, practices in, in computer engineering and uh, doing very challenging applications like scheduling, uh, diagnosis of power plants, all those kinds of things. So, but then I did more and more um, fundamental research and uh, worked quite a bit with Rodney Brooks on what is called behavioral-based uh, robotics in the late 80s. And then uh, also in uh, artificial life with Chris Langton and others and using biological metaphors and uh, metaphors from physics to find new avenues to uh, explore AI. And from the mid 90s, I, I started doing all sorts of experiments with the humanoid robots like the ones you see here. Um, and our question was what how do we, what do we have to put into these robots? What kind of programs do they need in order to create as a group? So we had several of these humanoids, uh, a shared language starting from scratch and not on, only learning the words and grammar, but actually also learning the conceptualizations of reality that they, they were using. So, uh, today, well, I'm still doing part of that, but I'm more and more involved in uh, issues related to um, human-centric AI, uh, value-aware AI, those kinds of things, because we see all sorts of limitations and negative side effects of certain types of AI. We will talk about that later, I assume. Um, and so... Uh, so this has become a real, real big issue. I mean, the, the ethics. Now, uh, why do I feel, um, you know, uh, possibly relevant for a panel like this one, which is about art and creativity? Uh, it's because um, during my whole career, I also have a lot of engagements with uh, artists. And uh, I, I cannot give a lot of examples, but I just give a few. Uh, one uh, in interaction I've had is uh, particularly with Olafur. I'm sorry, the name is spelled here. It's Olafur and not Olafur, Eliasson. And we did, for example, a project for the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris, uh, where you have, um, which is called Look into the Box. And basically, you look into this box and then your eye is uh, recorded and then you have some sort of processing on it, uh, you know, and then the, the, the key colors are being taken. But the interesting thing is that you have um, a kind of uh, agents, a population of agents that is creating a language during the course of the exhibition to talk about the color of the eyes of the visitors to the exhibition. So this was in 2002. And so here, this is interesting because, uh, you know, I worked with, with Olafur to uh, bring in the, the, uh, the work I was doing at that time in, in language evolution, concept creation, uh, color perception, color interpretation, and, uh, and the work that Olafur was doing while well, he was also working a lot on color and also on installations that would explore different aspects of color perception, and in this case of uh, color names, color language. Uh, this is another project uh, that I did with uh, Jean-Francois Perret. It's a, a theater play called Le Cas de Sophie K for the Avignon Theater Festival in 2005, which is one of the big European uh, theater festivals. And uh, this was about uh, a mathematician, uh, Kovalevskaya, who, um, who worked on quite esoteric mathematical uh, issues and issues in physics uh, about um, uh, uh, dynamics, uh, complex dynamical systems and things like that. Uh, this is another fascinating interaction because, uh, you know, we worked for two months to create this theater play and um, uh, basically through improvisations and by bringing in scientists to talk about what it meant to do mathematics and, uh, you know, what was so unique about the contributions of this particular 
uh, person, Sophie Kovalevskaya, who was one of the first mathematicians in Europe, actually, to, to be recognized and um, to break new ground. So the, the, she lived at the time of Dostoevsky, basically. Okay, so this was another project. And then I did some other projects. Um, well, I'm actually a composer, so I write music and uh, I wrote uh, two operas. One is Kasparov, which is about robots, actually. It's about AI, it's about robots. But I'm not really using AI to, to write the music because I think this would take away all the fun for myself. But, um, you know, we pose questions about the, uh, well, the, the, the robots. And this, this particular opera makes a lot of fun of all these futurists like uh, Kurzweil, who argue that uh, singularity is coming and, and all these kinds of things. So it's a, a tragic comic opera. Uh, there's another one that I did uh, with uh, Oscar Villarroya, who is actually a, a neuroscientist. He writes the librettos. And this was again about, um, actually about, uh, you know, life after death, immortality, and the use of agents and virtual worlds and, and all the questions that that come up with it. So, so actually, I'm, I'm using the medium of uh, opera to... Um, to raise issues that are that I cannot raise in my papers. I mean, I have a lot of scientific papers, hundreds of them, but um, I mean, I cannot in those papers I cannot raise the same kind of issues that I can do through this uh, artistic medium. And the funny thing is that uh, you know, when Nature wrote about my work, it was about this 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 particular opera rather than my actual scientific work. Anyway, the last, I, I just give, this is the final example. This year, last year, and the year before, uh, I have been uh, working a lot on studying creativity, and particularly by uh, cooperation, interaction with an artist called Luke Diamonds. Um, he's uh, at the moment one of the most important Flemish artists. And... Um, I started from his uh, solo exhibition at the Palazzo Grassi in, uh, in Venice in 2019, 2020. And the basic I, uh, question that, that I asked is, um, in order to understand his creativity, is to understand how, how the work is perceived. So it's not so much about the creation of new work, but you know what goes on in, in your brain, if you want, in your mind, when you're looking at an artwork. And so I did uh, an exhibition at the, at the Beaux-Arts uh, in Brussels, which is a, a big center, cultural center, the, the, the most important one in, in Belgium. And so we, we just looked at one painting by uh, Luc Tamans called uh, Secrets. And uh, so then I constructed, um, you know, I used a lot of computer vision algorithms to to extract features, to extract information uh, about this painting. And then a kind of uh, large, uh, what I call transient narrative network, which is all the kinds of things that, that come up when you really look at this painting, but also the cultural context, the social context and the interpretation and all of that. So. So this was a really interesting journey, which is not finished yet, but um, you know, which which brought out the the, the meanings uh, that that are in this painting, and actually, it's it's a never-ending interpretation process. And so, in in the exhibition, you saw a very big network that was expanding, and more and more nodes uh, were coming into the network. So I'm going to stop here. And I'm sure I look forward to, to discussion on the topics that uh, uh, Chao Wei, I hope I pronounce it the right way, is, uh, is uh, uh, questions that she has put to us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Um, and finally, we have uh, Emily Martinez um, who will be presenting. Hi, everyone. Um, 
I'm going to try to make this quick. So I started working with um, machine learning in 2018 um, with a project called Queer AI, which is a collaboration with Ben Lurchin. And we, um, we made a chatbot that was trained on queer theater. Um, I'm not gonna say much more than that. And then last year I started working on a beginner's guide for machine learning that was focused on text generating bots, um, but that specifically centered the needs of like small communities that are interested in working with their own texts, archives and like small data. And um, within the context of this type of like unsupervised machine learning for text generation, the thing that um, has been motivating me or I've been thinking a lot about is how to use this, these tools for poetics instead of for prediction, all the other ways that we've seen um, machine learning used, and also um, how to create tools for world building, mirroring, and self-reflection. And um, as far as like uh, preparing data sets, um, that's something that I'm also interested in like figuring out how to set up guidelines and processes that protect like bodies of knowledge from, you know, within whatever communities that honor lineage, that uphold ethical frameworks um, and that are rooted in like shared agreed upon values. Um, I think about things like, what does it mean to decolonize AI? And I could go on, but um, I won't. I actually just wanted to share some actual texts that I've been making with uh, GPT-2. So I'm gonna read a couple of pieces. And these are from, uh, I'm just calling this project Unsupervised Pleasures. And it's just a collection of these, these short little experiments. So the first three pieces I'm gonna read are, they were trained on the, the Queer AI corpus. And this first one is called The Tomb. Let me begin by telling you my ultimate fantasy. The tomb, the tomb, all the way up there. This is where we'll lie together, suck each other to death, orgasm together. Dirty love, deep throating, scary sex. The feeling is so real. You never get tired of the sound, the smell, orbiting the moons of Jupiter, the smell of urine in a swimming pool, orbiting the soles of feet, the taste. Relax, the taste is divine. The smell of a foot in a pool of urine is divine. This next one is called The Garden Party. Let me begin by telling you my ultimate fantasy. When I was in a garden party, I went down and met an old man who was dying of cancer. He was very kind to me and he asked me how I was doing. He said, goodbye, darling. You are much prettier now that you were at the party. I did not know what a garden party was. I thought it was just a party. Why would he come down and meet you? Well, he said, I must tell you that I'm very sad and that this is the best way I can express my feelings. I am on my deathbed. I don't know if I can live anymore. And for my part, I must tell you that I am sorry. I said, yes, I understand. What did he say? I'm very sorry. It seems I have lost my voice. I am so sorry. I hope I never lose it again. What did you say? Goodbye, darling. It is my last time with you. Okay, this next one is called The Halo Effect. Let me begin by telling you my ultimate fantasy. When I was making love to you, it was in the dark with the moon just barely in the sky. Stars were dancing across the brilliant night sky. In a blur, I pictured you sitting there, arms outspread, enjoying the view, your legs spread apart, completely nude from the lighting. There was just one problem. There was no starlight. Did you hear the one about how the stars don't glow because they're full of static? Well, that was true then and it's true now. Most of us just give up on stars when they get too crowded or are too bright. We settle for the halo effect or the twinkling of an orange. I want to go to a secluded spot where I can let my imagination run wild. Let it happen, even in New Orleans, it happens. I want to go to a secluded spot on a wooden pier where the waves crash against the side of a cliff and the water is so cold I can melt in it. I want to go to the edge of a lake where the waves crash against the metal deck and the wind is so strong that the sail of a ship can be seen twirling in the air. 
I want to take off my clothes in the moonlight and float naked across the cold waters of the Dead Sea. Um, give me one second. Okay, I have one more. Um, this is from a different corpus of uh, Western philosophers, which includes um, Spinoza, Nietzsche, William James, and Bergson. And it's called Life After Capitalism. And I'm gonna read the seed text first, which is what I gave it to work with. And then I'm just gonna read a little bit of what it generated. So here's the seed. After generations of living under colonialism, white supremacy, economic austerity, demoralizing levels of stress, social unrest, a global pandemic, endless fake news cycles, ecological catastrophe, unprocessed grief, extreme nihilism, and near climate collapse, the humans decided to end capitalism, overthrow their corrupt leaders and begin again. As they learned how to be in right relationship with the earth and each other, they started reflecting on their shortcomings and asking questions about the true nature of human bondage, human freedom, emotions, mind, God, consciousness, ethics, and morality. They ruminated on the consciousness of responsibility, debt, obligation, compensation, community injury, guilt, alienation, and atonement. It seems they knew little of pleasure and love that wasn't tied to suffering and pain. It became obvious, dot, dot, dot. And here's what the, um, the AI generated. It became obvious to them that all enjoyment, all order, all beauty, all reason, all social order, all being absolutely necessary to survive must necessarily be subordinated to the demands of the most violent the most vicious and the most highly developed interdependent powers of nature, the most powerful and richest, the most dominant religions, political systems, empires, and racial distinctions. Nothing remained for them but for revenge, the most ancient and newest form of revenge, the most radical act of self-criticism and personal repudiation, the self-emancipation of one who deserved all those advantages and privileges, the one who dared to be free the one who was nevertheless angry, disgusted, and bitter for them all to be masters of bitter revenge. And there's more, but I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Wow, I feel like that last text and your process of making it just, everything about it is like this incredible diagnosis of not only what's going on, but the traditions that we're, we're fighting against. Um, great, so now we're going to the panel discussion uh, section of our time together. Um, we have about half hour for discussion and also answering some of these great questions that I see that are coming through the Q&A. Um, and I think if folks wanna go back onto video, um, feel free. And I actually wanted to start with you, Buse, because I know your internet connection got cut off a little bit. Um, I'm wondering, you know, as a researcher, just to lay the groundwork for our discussion, you know, there's this one thread I think of AI ethics that's like, um, let's reform the system. And then another thread that I think emerging is like, you know, let's abolish, you know, certain AI systems entirely. Um, I'm curious, Buse, if you want to talk more about, you know, what you mean with like dreaming beyond AI. Is it like, you know, abolish AI period? Or is it like certain forms? Um, if you wanted to talk about that. Thank you. That's a great question and a tricky one. And I'm not um, totally set on it, but I'm just, you know, observing and collecting all the conflicting answers. And actually, recently we have um, published a manifesto, not a, a usual manifesto, but a M A N Y festo that stresses um, the plurality. Um, yeah, about the, con the colonial AI with a wonderful group of uh, researchers, academics and, you know, people from other backgrounds and occupations um, to question basically the concept of AI ethics that don't that doesn't stabilize um, 
existing forms of power that are embedded in AI. And one of the responses that came uh, via Twitter uh, was that, okay, how about, you know, accepting AI as, a, as an intrinsically colonial uh, and harmful technology, uh, which is true. I think there are technologies, there are certain technologies that shouldn't be built. Um, and currently, um, you know, when we look at the AI landscape, it seems to me at least that most of the AI technologies that we hear about um, are uh, mostly commercial profit, I mean, a private, driven by private companies. And uh, when we look at where are the other places where we interact with AI, for example, um, on a daily basis is, for example, borders. Uh, you know, so it's basically mo seems like mostly driven by surveillance control and profit. And, you know, we also most of the people also frame AI as a general purpose technology. Then, uh, you know, when it's proven, historically proven that uh, surveillance and control uh, and, and profit uh, harms uh, systematically certain communities and benefits systematically certain other communities, then uh, apply, actually adding the layer of technology and automating it uh, would be harmful. And yes, we should stand against that. But at the same time, uh, I think there are nuances. Uh, I, I think also there are, you know, a lot of uh, creative potential or, you know, potential in also Res allocating resources, managing resources, or also self-reflection. And I think, um, may, in my opinion, it's not very talked about, but it's, it can also be a great tool to um, unveil um, certain trends that we don't want to see of injustice, for example. And the authors of Data Feminism explain that a lot, uh, very well. Um, so I think they both exist um, together. And Dreaming Beyond AI, what we wanted to say is that Okay, we want to talk about technology, but um, I think we fetishize technology a lot and focus extremely on it. And it also affects the visions of future. When you talk about future or when you pronounce the word futuristic, people directly start thinking about gadgets and flying things and, you know, like, um, you know, like abstract screens on people's eyes and all that stuff that we're like fed basically. Uh, by a lot of maybe see, films and visions that we have seen. Okay, that's great. I'm not saying that that's bad, but how about uh, quote unquote social progress, however you want to define it? How about the nature of work uh, rather than the tools and gadgets that will facilitate it? If there is no change in the labor relations, then can we really call it, you know, um, the futures that we want? So this is what we wanted to talk about. We don't, we focus on technology and not the the air or the natural resources, planetary resources, human labor that makes it and we take it for granted while it's actually fading, you know, um, in front of our eyes. So for us, AI is a gateway to speak about other societal issues and that makes, um, uh, you know, technical people mad and uh, maybe they think that it's more less legitimate, uh, but we uh, basically want people, like I want my neighbors and I want my friends to engage with this conversation because their rights and access to opportunities are impacted. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Buse. Um, I think, you know, uh, as you were talking about this, it brought up this really great point and drawing upon actually uh, Luis's uh, question um, from the audience. So, you know, when we think of AI, as you were saying, there's this kind of profit driven, the GAFAM, so Google, Apple, Facebook, um, Microsoft. Um, and then there's open source tools like GPT 3 um, and, um, you know, processing, which also has like machine learning tools, which I think Sarah and Emily, you both use. Um, for the four of you, do you think this open source AI uh, will lead us to like a better AI future of like, we're going to make poetic AI? Um, and do you think it'll challenge kind of the power of these big tech companies? I think, I mean, I open source alone is not enough. Like, uh, I, as I mentioned in the brief answer to the question, like, it, GPT is open source just sort of in name only. It's got to be more than 
open source, it's got to be actually comprehensible to people. It's got to be um, that you can actually get in and understand how to work with something. And it's got to be about the ethics of how it was made and the people who are able to participate in the making of it. Um, and so examples like Processing Foundation are a lot more about how the community is built around the like products or the objects that are coming out of it and like what those things actually are and what their purpose is. So I think that it's a lot more holistic approach than just putting the open source label on it. If you're really focused on this sort of sense of elitism and like a, a, a model that's about like, how can we make it bigger? Which was like all of the hype around GPT in the first place was this, this idea of like, oh, it's dangerous. We can only give you a little bit. Then it's, and then, okay, here's the whole thing anyway. And just scraping from the entirety of the internet and not minding that a lot of the outputs were racist and sexist and extremely problematic and not asking questions about why should we make this or should we not make this? Like, just can we make this? So it's it's more about the ethos of how something is made than just have we opened it to the public? I just wanted to add to that um, as well. Open AI, the the uh, startup, whatever the startup, they're huge. They're like funded by like billionaires, billions of dollars in funding for this open AI. And from and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, but I think I read that they sold the GPT three to Microsoft. There was like some big controversy over that. So it's no longer open if Microsoft now is like, has ownership over that. Um, so that's just an aside, just to give more context and like, yeah, your original question, which is like, how do we even have any power over that? Like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't think we do, but um, I agree with everything that Sarah shared. And I think about like, the role of like an artist or someone in education. Um, and it's in trying to like understand like what's happening. Like we are in, like these systems are everywhere, you know, and they, they are ready. Um, like we're like, everyone's like immersed in like a world where like these machines and the software is extracting data and it's just, it, whatever. It's just like invisible to most people. So the, the more intelligible we can make that to at least give an understanding of like, what's going on, how are we being manipulated? Why don't, you know, why maybe you shouldn't want Alexa in your house or whatever it is that, you know, it's being sold to folks. It's like, this is fun and this is creative. I just saw the new um, Amazon is releasing this little robot that looks like Wally. -E. Have you all seen that? And it's called, I forgot what it's called. They, there's a trailer for it now. And I know that's gonna be the new Christmas toy, you know, and it's like this cute, sweet little thing, which is, again it's like not cute and sweet when you know what's all of the stuff it's extracting um so yeah i'll stop there because i feel like i'm just going out on a bit of a rant <laughs> we're here for it um luke and, and Fusit. oh sorry go ahead Sarah. i'll just add from a very practical level like when it was gpt2 i started using it and then when they expanded it they made it like a closed open beta and suddenly all of my tools broke because I didn't have access to it anymore. And that happened with the Lyrebird thing that I was using also to make the voices. So there's this like open source cycle where things get bigger and then they get bought and suddenly the artists using them or the people critiquing them no longer have access. And that is one thing when it's an artist making something to examine it critically, it's on a whole other level when it's predictive policing software and it's being sold to a police department and then modified for their proprietary use, but people are getting killed. Like these, these updates matter. Uh, Luke and Vusid, do would you like to add anything? Yes. Um, the first thing I want to say is that um, you know, uh, I guess for for me, AI is is a is a bit a different thing than for many people today. I mean, when it started, it was uh, 
basically developing all sorts of algorithms, many of them, uh, I mean, many thousands or families of algorithms, which are still being uh, used and developed today. And so it's a sort of scientific field, uh, exploring computation and exploring uh, what it means to be intelligent and all those things. And so this is still going on, but then you have this other kind of AI uh, where AI becomes almost a, a magical thing. You know, people don't know what, what it is, what's going on inside. I mean, they use it for some sort of purpose, uh, maybe a new purpose that was not originally intended. Um, but I mean, this is a, a new development. And I think we need to make a distinction between the field of AI as a, as a science and an engineering practice, and then what certain companies are doing with it. You know, and these companies, um, many of them in, in Silicon Valley actually, uh, they have a particular uh, ethics and a particular way of, of doing business. Now, they're, they're using AI techniques, I would say. Um, and then, you know, but, but we, have to, we have to talk about these practices, uh, independent of the fact that it, whether it's AI, because they use all sorts of other technologies as well. And so this is one thing. And the second thing is that, that uh, there's a sort of extreme focus today on a certain family of algorithms, which are deep learning, uh, convolutional networks, you know, basically statistical learning, uh, which uh, learn by trying to, to predict. And so they get rewards based on, on their prediction. Okay, fine. I mean, this is certainly interesting and powerful and useful for certain kinds of things. But we have to be aware that uh, these algorithms do not engage with meaning. And all the funny things we see, the weird things we see, is because that kind of AI uh, doesn't have any clue about meaning, is not even trying, right? I mean, like GTP3 and, and translation systems and um, uh, algorithms that are uh, telling you what you are going to see on Twitter, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things are not addressing the fundamental human question of meaning. And so uh, if they do language processing like translation, they are not first understanding and then translating, you know, they're just mapping n-grams to n-grams using a very big uh, associative network. And so I think also for artists, it's very important to, to, to realize, uh, okay, they're doing certain things and, and sometimes it's useful, uh, that's for sure, and they detect patterns. But the, the real thing that makes us human is that we, we are concerned with meaning and understanding and values and all those things are completely absent from that kind of AI. Thank you for that. Um, I think that actually leads us to um, my next question for the four of y'all. Um, and this actually dovetails uh, with your text, Emily, um, where um, first of all, there's a question from someone in the audience uh, where they can find the seed text from um, Life After Capitalism. But one of the things that I really loved about um, you know, your usage of these Western philosophers is that there's this kind of um, vocabulary of the dominant that's starting to emerge, of differentiation, of maybe like attributes and you know, classification um, that's at the heart of this Western philosophy, right? And so when we think about what it means to be human, um, that's often a contested space historically. Um, there's been people who labeled as not human. Um, I think a lot of this goes back to the work of Sylvia Winter. Um, so what does you know, the field of AI reveal to us about you know, what the imagined ideal human or ideal creativity is? Um, and you know, conversely, if that's not your cup of tea to answer like, well, how are you hijacking that, right? Because I see a lot of hijacking of those definitions. 
Um, Emily, I don't know if you want to start first. Um, sure. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, for me, a lot of the, I mean, actually going back to some of the stuff Luke was saying about like, it doesn't understand meaning and all of that. And even Sarah just talking about like working with GPT-2 and GPT, whatever, just trying to understand like what that thing is even doing is like, like when I think about like, what am I doing? What is this work? I, I can't even name it yet because I feel like I'm, I'm just trying to understand what is even happening. Um, so there's that piece of it. And then, you know, knowing like, like thinking about like the the system and the infrastructure and the the lineage of like what kind of thinking led to this technology unpacking all of that and then working with like you know that, that's very specific text of philosophers which I got from like uh the Gutenberg um what is it called project Gutenberg right which is again it's like I mean you can guess who's on there it's like it's the same legacy of the same type of writers like what's in the public domain what what do we have the most kind of you know, written recorded knowledge of, and it's like Western European, like whatever histories. Um, so, you know, taking all of that in context and then feeding it something, asking it like, what do we do? How do we return to like something that centers life? Or even this question about like creativity, when I think about like Google or somebody, you know, talking about like making creative tools I can't even, I laugh when I hear that because I'm like, what are we talking about? You know, I think about like Richard Florida and the creative class that brought us gentrification and it's the same thing. It's like subsuming something that comes from like a life force energy, but that's now being like, you know, subsumed. It's being, it's being like controlled to a different ends, which is to, again, being extracted, exploited to like keep the same people in power and like subjugating others. So anyway, to answer your question, um, like I've, yeah, feeding it this text, knowing like it's not gonna have an answer. It's just gonna go through its corpus and talk, you know, like give us something back that's gonna reflect, you know, what what those values are. There's 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 still something there that that's like the, the ethos of, you know, of the underlying philosophy that has to do with domination, power, division, like it, there's nothing like none of, I, when I think back to when I started even reading philosophy, um, something that struck me, and I was coming from like a place where like, when I was younger, the things that, that I was just uh, drawn to were more like metaphysical things and like, I don't know, like I was just living in a different world. And what really struck me was like, nobody talks about love or like being in a body, like I was like, what is going on, you know? <laughs> so I think for me now, um, like the one of the things I'm working on is, is like, one is studying like what is going on and also like kind of unpacking all of the, the stuff through the critical lens and then trying to create like a new corpus with text that center love, that center life, that center all of the things that are missing in like, you know, everything that's led up to our current moment in civilization. Others have thoughts? Um, unless, Busse, do you wanna go? Go ahead and I'll go after you. Okay, I just, I think that I really appreciate both Emily and Luke's comments kind of combining them, I think uh, is how I'm approaching working with the the out thinking about the inputs and outputs of these these and work working with these uh, tools is that it's it's like working with any artistic material it's not it's not collaborating with another artist it's working with material like language is material it's not understanding what I'm doing and having a conversation with a person it's numbers and it's making calculations it's just doing it at a very large scale so to and i think this speaks to a couple of the questions in the q a that it's not autonomous in that it has agency but it is pulling something out of the zeitgeist because there is some other form of analysis going on it's not a human level of understanding but there is something uniquely computational happening. So I think when we're talking, this is maybe a little more broadly why I get frustrated at 
panels that are around AI and creativity in general, that we have this like, how can we make AI more creative like humans? But we should be asking, what can AI do that's not human? And how can we use it and work with it like an artist works with a fabric or with language or with these other materials? Um, because it, like Emily's work is so amazing that it's pulling these things out that really do speak to these very human, very present current problems. But exactly like Luke is saying, it's not, it's not thinking, it's not understanding us. And that's really essential to remember. I'm really glad to have heard uh, all of you what you've been saying. I'm just I'm just going to think out loud with you. Um, I don't remember your question exactly, but the human, the machine, uh, you know, that kind of stuck with me. And I'm also thinking about Luke's comments um, about, you know, AI, thinking of AI as AI as engineering and science and AI as product. And I would also add AI as ideology. And I don't remember the the author of the an, an article, but it's it's also a myth, an ideology, and uh, you know very strong element in collective imagination. Um, so um, I feel like there are a lot of there are some um, confu confu confusing things uh, when we talk about AI, starting with the name artificial and intelligence, and I know that a lot of people especially who are engaging with this work on a professional level have been talking about this, but artificial and intelligence are very, very loaded terms. And if you also go back to the official, you know, like history and beginning of AI and Luke maybe can correct me if I'm saying something wrong, the at least the most popular definitions, although there's no consensus on the definition and actually making the definition of AI is itself political, uh, there is this, um, comparison between the human mind's capabilities. And this directly makes me think about, you know, then, okay, if we're trying to make intelligent uh, things, algorithms or AIs or whatever you want to call it, uh, then you have this complex that human beings have. So what about the human? If AI is creative, is it the end of humans? Is it going to take over and so on and so forth? So once like on the one hand, you're building it and you are measuring it against your own mind's abilities. On the other hand, you're computing with it. It's, it's you know, like the God complex building something at your own image. That's why I'd like to think of AI as a magnifying glass that shows uh, stuff about ourselves. And we don't like when it's the, the stuff that we don't want to see. And I think it, there's also a role that uh, Western thinking plays in, in this, in the sense that, you know, putting the separation basically between, you know, nature and, and, and um, alive, like th other, other things, basically humans and, and animals and so on. And also putting the human or the male human on the top of everything and also attributing or defining the concept of intelligence according to that. And I'm thinking about, you know, how this has been used or IQs and intelligence tests and intelligence is seen as like as a, as a masculine attribute, mathematics. I can even talk about my own experience in that. And, you know, without essentializing the gender, I'm not talking about gender, right? I'm talking about social constructions that are associated with uh, with it and and that therefore making certain human beings human and certain human beings less human and animals and other things things that are completely exploitable so i think the paradox is uh, partly at least rooted in this thought and if we decomplex or we you know like leave our complex of superiority a little bit at the door when we're engaging also with these statistical tools creatively or very pragmatically i think this could also open up bring some air into the room also when we're talking about you know vital topics as the regulations and rights and 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 so on thank you so much for that Buse. um luke did you have anything to add to that Oh, you're muted. Yeah, a lot. So I, I have to be uh, short because, you know, everybody here has many interesting things to say. Um, 
but it's indeed uh, fascinating to to look at at this word this word artificial intelligence seems to have a lot of power and not just today in fact if you look back you know because uh, ai started actually in the 1950s and uh since then there, there have been lots of discussions uh but if you want when the, when the word started it was um well there was an argument whether it shouldn't be synthetic intelligence or or some some word like that and basically it was very much out of a computer science perspective because it's about solving problems with computers which you cannot solve using normal algorithms for example because you have a combinatorial explosion you know and you have that in chess for example or in go or in, and so the reason to study chess is not to solve the chess problem uh, but but to study how you can deal with very large search spaces and and go around in these spaces and so a lot of ai is not about data it's not about uh, the, the statistical machine learning. I mean, this is just a very narrow, and I would say, in my uh, feeling, one of the least interesting aspects of AI, actually. It becomes more interesting if we think about things like attention, attention, right? Or wh wh when we think about uh, concepts and how they, concepts about uh, dealing with the world and wh where they come from and all those kinds of questions. So for me, AI is a way to, to pose the same questions that philosophy has posed, but do it from, from this uh, experimental point of view, a kind of experimental epistemology. Now, to, to, to go back to the, the, the thing about uh, creativity, um, you know, I would say that I, I know there is this, this hype about AI and creativity, and this is coming out of companies who have a stake you know, in, in their image of, of being on top of AI. But I mean, please don't be confused by that. This is, uh, this is part of PR efforts. And uh, myself and a lot of my colleagues, we are extremely annoyed by this kind of thing because, you know, it shows that either a disrespect for art, a disrespect for creativity, human creativity, and I would say that, like in Emily's case, you know, she's using AI as a tool to generate ideas, but she is the artist. The AI is not the artist. I mean, it's like a tool that you're using. Um, you know, when I, I write a composition, sometimes you, you have something written for, I don't know, let's say a hobo, and, and then you want it for flute. Okay, and then you have to transpose this in the score and do things like that. I mean, there are things, uh, programs that can do this for you. So they help you. And this is the whole idea. AI should help people who are creative, should help them to be creative by dealing with all sorts of issues, you know, about, for example, synthesizing a score, a musical score, or visualizing or do a 3D uh, rendering of I don't know what. And so AI does, does can do a lot of things, fantastic. But I would argue strongly that an AI system is not creative. You know, it's, it's a tool. And if we, we use this tool, it's a bit like uh, John Cage used to use the I Ching when he was composing. Um, and so it's not the I Ching that is writing the composition, it was John Cage. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you for that. Um, and I love all of the perspectives that you all are bringing in. I feel like we could keep discussing, but also for the uh, discussing, but for the first, uh, for the sake of Zoom fatigue, I think we'll have to wrap. Um, one thing that's coming up in the, um, uh, from the audience is wanting some resources um, from folks. So uh, panelists, if you wouldn't mind um, under the uh, chat section, you can chat to everyone. If there's any resources on thinking about public knowledge around AI, also your own um, websites, um, if you would like to share them, um, feel free to drop those into the chat. It'll be helpful for folks. 
Um, and yes, uh, our next nodes is October 28th, and we'll actually be continuing on the discussion of sustainability. So uh, some of the things that uh, Buse and Sarah already brought up around the tools and the tools we use to make art and the sustainability um, literally around them, around labor and the environment. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists if you have any last parting words of advice for those who are using uh, AI in their art. Um, speak now <laughs> is the chance. Okay. Um, this was an amazing panel. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you, Thank so you much. everyone. Thank you.